everyone. So my, my name is Martin, I'm a software engineer for Red Hat, uh, and I work for the Factory 2.0 team. Okay. And my name is Julia, I also work for the Factory 2.0 team. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, can you hear me? Yes, okay. And so the purpose of our project in, is to, let's say, automate and improve the release pipeline process in Fedora and internally in Red Hat. And uh, the one that you see on the slides are the services that we develop and maintain, some of them, the major at least. And um, we just want to explain a bit uh, what our project is doing so that uh, we can explain what we did uh, in the last quarter for the monitoring to monitor those services so that you can maybe understand what we are talking about. Uh, yes, please. That, that, uh, some of those uh, uh, microservices that we have are open source. Uh, they are also included in Fedora, uh, but not all of them because we have some also uh, internal. And so we can maybe say that the project is um, divided in two big branches, and we decided to call them today the container build pipeline and the gating pipeline. So. Uh, the, the first one is the container rebel pipeline. So when uh, containers started to be big, uh, companies and everyone started to, to use them and wanted to, to uh, incorporate them in their, in, into their releases. So it's the same did, uh, did, uh, did also we. And uh, this per uh, precise uh, pipeline is uh, mm -hmm designed to rebuild containers when there is a CVE, which means a security bug found in some RPM, uh, and then uh, we need to find out which containers are affected and then uh, rebuild them. So that's the main gist of it. Uh, so also not only to, to rebuild, to start the process to rebuild them, that's, that's mostly done by the first maker microservice, uh, but also to, to move those um, artifacts in our uh, release, uh, release pipeline. So create tickets for the QE teams, uh, make sure that everything is tested, and then move them to release. Yeah, this is like a, just a uh, graph. You can see that how, how it works. I won't go into details because we don't have time but for that. But uh, it's just for like that you that you can see if, to visualize how, how, how it looks like. So, and instead the gating pipeline, we just call it this way, and it's the process to build and release RPMs in Fedora and internally in Red Hat. And um, so basically, you just have uh, many steps through the pipelines, and you just want to have some uh, tests between them, so you just want to be sure that your RPM or your software artifact can go from one step to the next one. And our services, um, the one that we implemented in Factory, um, makes you sure that they can go to the next, pro next step. So it's like, uh, we call them gating. I, I just see, I'm not sure it's actually true, but I just see it as a gate. So like, if the gate is closed, it cannot go to the next step. And, and yeah, so all these services uh, talk to each other through messages, so in, through a message bus. And um, as when we started putting our services in, in production, we, yeah, this is the graphical representation. And <laughs> so at the bottom you see the pipeline, and at the top there are our services. And when we started putting our services in uh, production, we started noticing that messages mm, were lost, like getting lost, and maybe the cluster isn't working, or the API is not working, and people were starting writing to us on IRC in the chat, like, uh, this is not working, do you know that? And we were like, no, like, <laughs> why? And what you have to do is like to connect to the cluster, check the logs, and you don't know what is happening, you don't know when that started. So it's not nice if the user tells you that there's something wrong with your services. You should know that it's your service. So. And so we decided to put in place monitoring. 
and to have some detection of the issues and also to know when that happened and why and um, to have more information to debug the problem. So in the end we noticed that what we were missing was what it's here. So, and we tried to find the best technologies that could be suitable for us and to cover all these cases. And we are going to explain now what we did. So yeah, the first one was, was health check and, and magic. So, so we were thinking what, what, what to use for that. As, as you know, if, if you already done monitoring, there is like really a lot of solutions that you can use for that. Uh, mostly what we thought was like, okay, so uh, all our um, microservices are mostly containers and they are running on uh, 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 OpenShift. So we were like, okay, so Prometheus was like really the best choice we could do. What, what are the benefits of Prometheus were mostly that it's really to, uh, easy to integrate with uh, containers or microservices as uh, the only thing that you need to do to get your metrics out of your application is just to add a new uh, RESTful um, endpoint and just, uh, just configure what statistics you want to uh, extract from your applications. Uh, Prometheus stores uh, the... or the all the metrics uh, on the side of the applications are stored in memory and uh, Prometheus uses the pool uh, mechanic to get this, this data out of, um, out of the uh, microservices. Another uh, thing was that it's like really good friends with Kubernetes or OpenShift. Um, you, can, you can have like uh, several uh, exporters which are designed to not only monitor your application but uh, applications but also monitor the uh, insights of your Kubernetes cluster or your OpenShift cluster. Uh, yeah, and another thing Prometheus has so-called exporters which are additional microservices which you can do. It's like a middleman between your uh, microservice and, and your um, uh, Prometheus instance where you can uh, connect to your uh, container and get additional uh, metrics like MySQL, uh, database metrics, system metrics, uh, storage metrics, uh, a lot of stuff. I need uh, everything already exists, mostly it's, it's quite fast, we can go. Uh, and also uh, Prometheus has a lot of um, client libraries written I think in 10 languages already. So it's like, and it's open source. Yeah, and, uh, so the next <coughs> part was, okay, so we need to at least to know, uh, to have some information about our logs. So for that we used elk, uh, an elk stack, but uh, to tell you the truth, I will just go really quickly through this because we, right now we are just using uh, like the elk stack for the two of our services, so it's not much. Uh, most, mostly we aggregate there our logs and looking for facebooks mostly. So and what's ELK, uh, ELK stack uh, X, uh, is? Uh, ELK uh, mean, is an uh, acronym uh, of, of free open source projects and that's uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana. Uh, Elasticsearch is uh, a search engine where you can just put your, uh, put your data like logs and then just search through them through different statistical functions and I don't know what more. Uh, Logstash is a data, data uh, pipeline where you can add multiple sources and it will just crunch and store your uh, data. And Kibana is for visualization of your data. Okay, so we noticed that after those two technologies we still didn't have completely what we wanted, so um, <coughs> mostly we, we have a lot of services that talk through messages and we didn't have a way to find out if the messages was working, like uh, if messages were sent and, and received in a proper way. So we have um, the message bus and we di didn't know how to check that. We couldn't do that with Prometheus or like maybe you can see if your consumer is up, but you don't see if the messages are going and if they are correct. So we decided to implement a couple of E2E checks. We call them this way. And, and yeah, we are just going to explain. So the first one is about the pipeline that I showed you before. And we are just uh, trying to send 
a message on the message bus with, it, yeah, it's a Jenkins job and that tries to do many steps. And um, like the most important one is emitting these messages. And um, so these messages are fake data, but we are realistic one. So it actually, they are about some fake package. And we try to send a message and see if after this message we have what we expect. So for example, um, I emit a message about a new result in this, um, about uh, a test. And I expect to see this uh, test in the database in my software after this message. And I check this step. If I don't have the item or I don't see the message in the message bus, there's something wrong. And the good thing of this is that you have all the stages separate, so I can see exactly where the problem is. So um, this is checking several software, so I immediately see which one is not working. And this runs every 10 minutes and it sends an email if the job fails. And um, yeah, the, maybe the bad thing about it, the downside is, but I think this is like in every technology, this is developed with Jenkins, so it runs in Jenkins, so if Jenkins has a bug, we cannot um, avoid that. Like, for example, sometimes we get mm, an alert that it's not true just because Jenkins wasn't able to pull the code uh, for the test. So we get an alert on that, but that's not a true alert, and there's nothing we can do about it. So. Yeah, maybe I will just add yeah, that uh, same, uh, when we are running this Jenkins job and sending the data, this is done on production. It's not done yes. like on a stage or there when we are running this production. Yeah, so you see an alert from production, you actually get worried and, and it's nothing, so it's not nice. So, uh, this is uh, the second one it we uh, monitoring or uh, we, I call it uh, E2E probe. Uh, this is uh, like more or less still a work in progress. But the, the main idea of this was that like, like when we have the segment test, we are <coughs> sending uh, artificial data to, to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to our environments and we see how it behaves. But what I was thinking like, maybe we could just like use the data that really flows through your pipeline. So, so the main idea was to write reusable test uh, playbooks, tests or playbooks or monitoring solutions with Ansible and then just schedule them in a right way to, to execute on your pipeline when they are triggered by some message. So for example, as already Julia said, we have a new test result. This test result will come in and the test result is published on a message queue and will tell us like, here you go, here's a new message. So, uh, so this will trigger uh, my, my, my uh, scheduler, which will then run um, uh, the Ansible playbooks in a configured way and will wait on other events that will uh, appear in our pipeline. And then we will cons you can then check every uh, point <laughs> in, your, in your pipeline and see if, if it's working or not with the real data. The, um, uh, uh, another benefit, what, what, what I found out is that when you write playbooks for uh, to like you want to describe your pipeline or your uh, process in your pipeline by an Ansible playbook, you find out if your uh, play, uh, and see, uh, if you if your pipeline is too complicated because if it's hard to write, then it's mainly not a good idea. So, uh, for example, I found out that that some some of the configuration that we have is hard coded in the code. So I, when I wanted to replicate it. I found out that it's hard code in the code, so I had to uh, look into the code. Uh, we, we already, um, that I think there is an initiative to, to move this uh, configuration to a normal YAML file or something where you can like easily see what it is. So yeah, yeah, that's that. Um, the downsides of this uh, is that it's written in Go. Uh, it started as a Prometheus exporter. The downside of this is that uh, it's not really good if you have a lot of uh, high volume queues with all the messages because then the application will not be able to uh, follow up with that. So that's, that's maybe the downside for that. But for, for like, for uh, what I tested is like 
30 to 50 messages for, uh, per second are still fine. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Here we have some links to the uh, uh, to the services that are open source, and you can find them find them uh, in Fedora, like Greenway Refreshmaker. There, I would say they are both the biggest uh, services in their respective uh, pipelines. And of course, you have also um, some links to primitives. Yeah. yeah, and actually today we just explained the open source solutions that we decided to use. We also used. Another one, but we're not going to talk about it because it's, yeah. it's not nice to use non-open source stuff. Don't yeah, use yeah, non-open yeah, yeah. source there stuff. And also, as we said, already there is a, a, a lot of uh, other <coughs> solutions or so proprietary that you, know, you can use. Yeah. But this and is the yeah. easiest way for, for containers to get monitoring up and running. Yeah, I would like to mention that uh, some other team um, helped us with that and they are having a talk later at 12.30. <laughs> Uh, about holistic monitoring and um, more SLI, SLO. So if you're interested, just go there. And I think that's so we are, are there any questions? Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay, so <laughs> when you had the example with like distinct real messages mm -hmm. and it was in Jenkins, do you trigger that by some timer or yeah. yeah, like in Jenkins you have the cron thing and you can set it up like, like it's like a normal cron and, tab. And the, and the job is running every every ten minutes. Actually, I think I changed that. Maybe it's fifteen now because uh, we had the issue that mm, um, like. Sometimes the messages take some time to be delivered. Like sometimes there's some lag, and uh, like it took maybe one minute, and we just put some retry, some more retry, and so sometimes it can take a lot of time to run the the also, job. Also, that's like a, um, we had a problem <coughs> with, with Prometheus that uh, in OpenShift uh, you have. Um, if you have multiple pods for one application, on one application <coughs> they, they are behind the proxy. So the problem was that you had multiple replicas and you wanted to check like, the metrics from all the replicas. But when you have a load balancer, which is like round robin, then there was a problem that we didn't know which one it was. It. OpenShift locally inside its namespace, when you have a project, it, it has its own namespace and it, ha it has its own local network, every, every project in OpenShift. That's the same in uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so we were thinking how to like resolve that. So we, we went uh, in the end we went with a solution that we just uh, um, uh, make the project where the Prometheus instance was running to be able to to see into others uh, local networks like uh, to other other projects in in our cluster. Of course, when you are just deploying Prometheus. Uh, you don't need to have admin rights, but if you want to do this, you have to have admin rights on your cluster. So that's a little bit downside. But there is another solution, but it's not so good. Uh, is the or good? It's, it's worse, I would say. Is that you can um, Prometheus uses the, the pool model, so it always takes the data. So you could just do the opposite, and you just the the, the pods could push the data. But then you don't know if the if one of the pods will go down. You know, it's. Yeah, so that's like just just the one thing that we have problems with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, so Martin, you were talking about in the green pro, but for me it was really hard to visualize. You can make an example. Yeah, <coughs> maybe. Wait a second. So. Uh, the, the pipeline starts from uh, left to right. So when there is a when, when a data tool has a has a like a fixed CD, it will send a message, and then you go to the other uh, microservice. FreshMaker will listen f f for messages from a data tool. It will if if if, it, uh, if if the correct message FreshMaker will start rebuilds on containers that he knows which he should rebuild, 
and the, let's say, and the idea of the E2E -E probe was that, okay, so I have a exporter which is listening to uh, the UMB and trigger for the whole check will be a message from a data tool. So when, when a message of a data tool will be available, the, 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 the scheduler will listen to it, it will identify it's the correct message that he wants, and then he will start, uh, in, in a, he will just take the configuration that he has, and there are several uh, Ansible playbooks configured, and he, uh, for different points, like this is the first point, this is the entry point, this is the trigger. The second point is, uh, did Freshmaker start the rebuild according to this message? So I will, like, like oh, there is a playbook which will always, uh, uh, like, I I repeatedly uh, query the REST, REST API of FreshMaker and you'll like listen. This is the ID of the message. This, uh, did, did FreshMaker start uh, the rebuild according to this message? If yes, there is, of course, there is a timeout and so you can configure that. And uh, yeah, if it will be, if it will start and it will, will be successful, it will wait for that, then that's fine. And then we go to another point, which the, the point, another point of this is that when FreshMaker finishes the rebel, it will send another message to the UMB, to the, the message queue. Uh, so I'm checking for that message. Like, is another <laughs> listener will listen to that, and <coughs> the, the, uh, it will take uh, uh, the listeners for for messages work like this. They listen to the uh, to some queue. When the message comes, the message will, will be taken and uh, input. Like it will be injected into a, a playbook, and the playbook will just evaluate it. Uh, yeah, why I used Ansible is that I didn't want to write it in some like normal language because you know like Ansible is like standardized, so it's it's not it's not easy every time. But at least I have like and, you, and another thing when you use Ansible is that you can use Ansible and just write without anything, just 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 write it, and you will just check your Python <laughs> and you will see if it's okay or not. You don't have to use the scheduler or ever, anything. <laughs> No, yeah, and so on, so on, so on. It will like repeat itself all, uh, all the time. And of course, when the when the whole thing will go down successfully, you will have a record. All the logs, all the messages will be like saved. If it will fail, uh, or the timer will like go out, then it will fail. So then you will also have the record. So I will stop at the point. So the problem was that I had a lot of work, so I wanted to I, I wanted to get it uh, like out. Before this talk, but me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This message, message bus, what do you use for this uh, UMB? Yeah, yeah. It's like just the, like an internal name of, in Red Hat. Uh, this is like a normal message queue, like yeah, zero MQ or IMQ. It's active. Active. Oh, sorry. Yeah, active MQ. For, for yeah, for uh, for. Um, in Red Hat, we have uh, active MQ, and I think in uh, Fedora, it was zero, zero, um, yeah, yeah, zero MQ. Okay. Okay. One more question. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, that was not a short one, but I was going to say if you wanted to talk really quick about the, how the second test works, and like what, what it sends, oh. you know, what, what it triggers, and then what it looks for. Yeah, I can. Try in one minute. So it's checking green wave results DB, waiver DB, data grapper, and the message bus at the same time. So in the first step, it checks if green wave is like okay, if the API is working and the data are consistent. Then it emits a message on um, the message bus about the new result, and then I expect. Uh, to see, I query the results DB API to see if the message is, is if the result is there. Then I check if GreenWave uh, saw that new result that was passing. So it, GreenWave will now say um, all your tests are satisfied. <coughs> and then I just create a new result, but this time it's failing. And so that will trigger uh, again GreenWave saying now your tests are not satisfied, so you cannot go to the next step. And then I create a waiver that ignores the previous failing test. And GreenWave now should wake up again and say, OK, now everything is fine again, so you can go to the next step. And that's it. Is it good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs>